scripture message. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 13 to 15. 1 Timothy 6, 13 to 15. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing for Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time, God the blessing and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its power. We pray this morning that you will help us to learn from your word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So this is the third of four Advent messages. And uh, today we're going to focus on King of Kings. And so uh, earlier uh, this year there was big news uh, in the newspaper on the internet that a king was coming to Los Angeles. And his name is King James. <laughs> so King James came to Los Angeles. And who, who is that? Austin? LeBron. LeBron James. And so. Uh, 50, 60 years ago when we said King James, we were, we were talking about using the King James version of the Bible because King James was one of the rulers of England. But uh, there's a famous basketball player, LeBron James, who is, who is that's his nickname. And so, the, and so when we talk about uh, a king, we need to know what he is king of. And so he's known as the best basketball player. And amazingly, the Lakers are now winning because they have the best basketball player. So I was excited about King James. Uh, about 30 or 40 years ago, um, when uh, the, uh, someone who was known as the King died in 1977. And so when, when we said the King, it's really that's like saying the King of Kings. That's a superlative. And so the King was someone who was known as, actually also as the King of Rock and Roll. That was Elvis Presley. So that's, that was a while ago, but his nickname was The King, because there had been nobody like him in uh, rock and roll. And so he, was, he, would sing in a, he would sing and play his guitar, and people, uh, usually teenage girls, would, would faint, and they would, they would fall down, and they would, they would worship him. He had this, this uh, amazing power, and he revolutionized a rock and roll, and it was a big scandal, but he was, that was his nickname. And so the question is, how do people become kings? Um, and uh, one way is, is, is a, in a spiritual sense, a mandate. So LeBron James, uh, Elvis Presley, they don't really have a kingdom, but they are, they, they are perceived to be higher than other people. And so that's, that's almost, almost a, a, a supernatural thing. Uh, Elvis Presley was seen as having a supernat supernatural talent. Uh, and the other way to become king, another way is to have a powerful army. So throughout history, many kings um, said, okay, I'm king, and they would conquer territory, and they would, they would rule, and they have to have a way, and that would be uh, usually having a powerful army. And then a third way, other than a spiritual mandate or powerful army, would be you just say that I'm king. It's a self-proclaimed proclaimed king. And so a good example... Uh, in the 1800s in San Francisco, uh, there was a, a man named, uh, uh, named uh, uh, Joshua Abraham Norton. He was born in 1818. He came to San Francisco. And in 1859, he said, he proclaimed himself as the emperor of the U.S. Emperor is another name for king. Um, and so he said, I am Norton I, emperor of the United States, in 1859. And... Um, Later, uh, he basically uh, uh, became honored in San Francisco. And so we say, well, was, what was he king of? Well, uh, a lot of people thought it was a joke. And so people are wired to, to worship. We know that people, people, many people like to have a king, somebody who is, who is, um, who is their leader. And so uh, Emperor Norton would, and I've got a picture of him here, uh, he, he would um, uh, dress up as a king. So that's part of the, the, the role is that he would dress up as a king. And so kings look like kings. They have, usually have a crown. So he had a fancy hat with a peacock feather in it. And he had a sword because he didn't have an army, but he wanted people to, to realize he was powerful. 
and he would issue proclamations. So that's what kings do, is they issue proclamations. That's a way to communicate with their, uh, with their subjects. And so here's one of his proclamations. He said, uh, at the preemptory request and desire of a large majority of the citizens of the United States, which isn't true at all, I, Joshua Norton, uh, uh, for the last nine years and ten months, passed of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself emperor of those United States, and in virtue of the authority thereby I vested, do hereby order and direct the representatives of the different, different states of the Union to assemble in musical hall of this city, first day of February, next, and then and there to make such alterations in, in the existing laws of the Union, um, so that the evils under which the country is laboring and thereby cause confidence to exist both at home and abroad in our stability and integrity. So it's almost like gibberish, but he sounds like a king. And so uh, it, this actually was, uh, people thought it was funny, and so they printed it in the San Francisco newspaper. And people said, oh, this is great, we have, a, we have an emperor. And his big thing was he, he wanted people to, uh, to get rid of the, of the uh, he didn't think the government of the United States was good, so he said, I'm going to take over. And again, he, his orders were ignored by the army, for instance, and he even issued his own currency. His own, so that's what, what kings do, is they have their own currency. And he spent his days walking around the streets of San Francisco, um, inspecting things. That's what the kings do. So he, he would look things over, and he would issue proclamations, and he would use his money, his currency, to buy things. That, at the restaurants, and the, but because people respected him, it actually was used. So, so now you can actually, they're, they're worth a lot of money, his own, his own, um, uh, his own currency, and I've got a picture here. Um, and so, uh, but people knew that he really wasn't emperor or king, he was just a, an eccentric, uh, funny guy, but, but he was a self-proclaimed king. So when he, when he, um, when he died, there, there were 10,000 people that lined the streets of San Francisco to, uh, to, to pay homage to him, even though he was not really king of anything. But I think that's part of what we learn, we see in scriptures, people want to have a king to worship. You remember way back in the Old Testament, uh, God said, no, you don't really need a king, but the people called for a king, and that's how King Saul was anointed by God, because he said, okay, you, know, you, can, you can have your way, we'll have King, king Saul, and it didn't work out that well. Uh, and people, so basically people want a king, and so King or Emperor uh, Norton, um, uh, people thought it was funny, but they also paid homage to him. And it was interesting when you, when you see, a lot of kings are visionary and have projects, so one of, his, one of his projects was, he said we should have a bridge from San Francisco to Oakland. This is before there were any, any big bridges, and so he was a, had a vision of the, what's now the Oakland Bay Bridge, and so there was a movement to name the bridge after him. Because it was, which didn't happen, but uh, that's that's uh, Emperor uh, Norton. Uh, England, uh, many in, in England um, uh, focus so much attention on the royals, and so this is this is the other way to be king is to be born is to have your father be a king, and so a big a lot of attention was was given to Prince um, Prince William when he got married, right, and Prince Harry. So Prince William will be the next. Uh, will be the king of England when his mother uh, passes away. And so that's the other way to become a king, is to have, a, uh, have it be hereditary. And so we see in history this has happened a lot. Um, one of my favorite examples is the king of Thailand. Anybody heard of him? King Bhumibol. King Bhumibol died in 2016. He had been reigning as king of Thailand for 70 years. He was the longest reigning monarch. Uh, uh, at, up to that time, so 70 years he was reigning as king of Thailand, and he was a, he was, a, it was it's a it's a, a um, uh, succession because he's actually the ninth he was the ninth king in a succession of royalty, and so his his family that was reigning in Thailand is um, it's the house of Chakri, and so his name was Rama the ninth, so. So, because his father was Rama the Eighth, and so this is a succession, and so this is not the case, obviously, in Scripture when we say the King of Kings. Uh, it's not heredity, except when we look at, at, at the real world. That's
that's what happens. So uh, King Bumibol was born in the U.S. actually, because his father was studying at Harvard, uh, and he reigned for 70 years. And uh, basically what happens a lot nowadays is the king has a kingdom, but is not the ruler or, or the leader of the country. So the prime minister is the one that makes decisions in Thailand. But the king is there under the authority of the army. So in Thailand, there's been a whole series of coups where a new uh, political party will want to take over. And the important thing when you have a coup is to get the backing of the king. And so this has happened repeatedly in history, as, as the king uh, uh, supports one of, the, uh, one of the leaders of Thailand. In fact, the current leader of, the current prime minister of Thailand is actually a, a military uh, general. He was put in position by the uh, because the king supported him. And then, so King Bumibol died in 2016, and so who's his successor? One of his sons. And his son has been married three times, is kind of a playboy, is not much respect, but that's what happens in, in the succession. Um, you say, well, is that just Thailand? But it turns out in, Indonesia has had a ton of kings. And so I did some research, and there was a, a kingdom called uh, Srivijaya, which was a naval kingdom in Sumatra. So from about 600s to 1414, uh, that kingdom dominated the Malacca Strait, and they controlled the trade, and there were leaders. Uh, later, there was a kingdom called the uh, Majapahit. Pahit. Have you heard this before? So it's in history books? Yeah, so they, though these are kingdoms. And usually the kingdoms are pretty small, and basically, if, if you have military power, you can be the king. Uh, later, in Indonesia, a lot of Southeast Asia, uh, the Muslim armies came in, and the kingdoms were called sultanates or uh, caliphates. And so, throughout history, you have all these kingdoms. In, uh, in Saudi Arabia has a king, uh, and so uh, so we look at that and we say, well, how, you know, how does this apply to what we read in Scripture? Because in Bible time, there's the same idea. Uh, at the time of the birth of Jesus, there was King Herod, and so we look at Matthew two. Um, king Herod uh, knew the prophecy that there would be a king of the Jews born. And so King Herod, and this is a familiar passage uh, that we read in the Christmas story, um, uh, when the wise men came from the east uh, and they were saying, where has been born the king of the Jews? Uh, we want to worship him. And so King Herod was worried because he knew the prophecy. The prophecy, this is of Micah chapter 2, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And so King Herod um, was worried because kings want to hold on to their job. And, uh, and so he, uh, many kings, to make sure that they stay king, they kill their rivals. And so that's what King Herod wanted to do. So if you remember the story, he sent the wise men uh, he summoned them secretly and ascertained from them what time the star appeared, sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the child. When you found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. But he just wanted to kill him. And so we know the story uh, that the angel told the wise men to go home another way. And when they had departed, um, uh, then an angel told Joseph and Mary to flee to Egypt so they would be safe. And King Herod. Uh, Matthew 2.16 says, Then Herod, when he saw had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. He sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under because he didn't want anybody to take his job as king. And so this is a major story. Um, with any king, they want to hold on to their job and they often kill their rivals. And uh, King Herod was thinking from an earthly sense, but this prophecy was saying, this is from the the, uh, the spiritual rescue from the spiritual sense. And so when we look at the passage, uh, and what, is this, what is Jesus supposed to be? 1 Timothy 6, uh, verse 15, which we read earlier. <coughs> okay, this is actually talking about uh, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed only ruler, the king of kings, the Lord of hosts. So this is, this is God's kingdom. So that's the most important thing to realize is we're not talking about a, an earthly kingdom. Uh, this kingdom is often called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of bless you or the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus is being born uh, and 
he is the king of kings. He is the ruler of the kingdom of heaven. And so when we look at, at uh, for proof of this, we look at what John the Baptist said. John the Baptist in Matthew 3, verse 2, uh, he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that's what John the Baptist is saying. And, and so how do we join this kingdom of heaven? He said, we need to repent. Um, and then, when Jesus teaches, many times throughout the, throughout the teaching of Jesus, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking directly about, follow, uh, about uh, becoming a Christian. He's talking about becoming a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So when we look at Matthew 6, 33, uh, familiar passage, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so this is something uh, that we seek on a part of the kingdom of heaven, uh, and we seek this, uh, and we become part of the, of the, of the kingdom by, uh, by repenting and believing. And so uh, we see many messages throughout scripture. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Daniel 4.3, uh, said his kingdom is an eternal kingdom. So it doesn't end. So a lot of kingdoms, earthly kingdoms, they come to an end. The kingdoms in Indonesia would come to an end. Usually it's because the, uh, the successor is incompetent, the army becomes not so strong, uh, or the successor dies and there's nobody to step up. Uh, so there, 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 are, there are not many uh, eternal kingdoms, but this is the, the eternal kingdom. Psalm 103 verse 19 uh, uh, says, The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. So this is talking about the spiritual rule over the hearts and lives of those willing to submit to God's authority. And so this is the kingdom that is being discussed. Um, and it's actually, it's interesting, um, King of Kings is not mentioned, is only mentioned three times in the New Testament. Um, and so I, the, uh, the Timothy passage is one, and the other two are in Revelation. Uh, and we, one was in the opening scripture, but, but one of the most interesting is Revelation 19 verse 16. And so this is talking about the future, the prophecy, uh, Revelation 19 verse 16. And many, many have this passage tattooed on their bodies. So we're going to talk about, about that. But here's where it comes from, Revelation 19 verse 16. So this is, a, this is the, the revelation of God to John. Um, so these, are, these are visions. So Revelation 19 verse 16 says, On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lords of Lords. So you look around and, and some people have tattoos that say, King of Kings and Lords of Lords, on their thigh. Right? They said that's what it says in scripture. So they tell their parents it's okay to have a tattoo. So I'm going to address that, that's important. And so, and so many people, and this is actually a revelation, a prophecy about Jesus, because revelation is, is when, the, when Jesus returned to the second company. So the question is, did Jesus have a tattoo? So I'm going to answer that question. And the reality is, so this is, a, this is John's vision, this is the battle of Armageddon, kind of the end times, and it says, you see Jesus riding from heaven on a white horse. That was before what I read. Waging war against the beast evil forces, and again, it says, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so, people say, Jesus has a tattoo on his thigh. The reality is, this revelation is filled with symbolism. Because okay, so, later it says, in the same passage, Jesus' eyes are said to be like blazing fire. His robe, it says, is soaked in blood. So is that true? It's a, no, it's a vision. Uh, it's, a, it's symbolism. So not, uh, and it also says in verse 15, uh, if you go back, back up, uh, it says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. Okay, so that's, that's a symbolism. And, and so the reality is, um, uh, the mention of the name being written on his robe and his thigh, the name King of King and Lord of Lords, could, uh, could very well mean that the words were not even on his skin, but rather they were written on his, on his robe, or part of what covers his thigh, or symbolism. And so, um, many times a king would have this title or, or honorific uh, 
woven onto his garments in a grave. So even Jesus, remember when he went before Pilate in his trial, uh, he was given a crown. And what did it say on his crown? King of, King of the Jews, in a mocking way. And so many times, King of King of Lord of Lords could be on somebody's cloak. Uh, and, uh, and, or on the sword many times. So it's, it, this commentator says the words on the, the scabbard, which is the cover of the sword, uh, would basically be at the thigh level. So it could be on his sword where those were, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Or he could have been wearing a banner or sash. We don't know. Uh, but it does not seem that Jesus has an actual tattoo. In, uh, in fact, uh, scripture, we also need to test things against other scriptures. So if we look at Leviticus uh, 19, verse 28, uh, the Jewish law says, Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Okay, so uh, one of my daughters came to me uh, about three months ago and said, Dad, I'm not going to do this, but if I got a tattoo, would you, would, what, would you, what would you say? Is that an interesting question? And so what should I say in response to that? And so um, my response was, you know, if, if you need to pray about it, because that's a big decision, obviously. And, and so I don't judge people that have tattoos. I want them to, to, to work it out between them and God. A lot of people have... Now, some people have a Bible verse tattooed, right? Or have a tattoo in a conspicuous place. And so it's important. So I told my daughter, um, you know, I love you unconditionally. So if you get a tattoo, it won't change the way I love you. But I want her to realize it's a big decision. And so I would, my advice, and I've chosen not to have tattoos, um, but ultimately she has to make the decision. And she has to make the decision with guidance from God. So I, so I turn her to this passage, and I, and I, um, uh, and, I and ultimately it's what God says. So, uh, so be, sh be sure to realize Pastor Andy is not telling you it's okay to get a tattoo. It's, it, but it's between you and God. And I interpret my advice is to not get a tattoo. And but again, some people use this passage to say, oh, Jesus has a tattoo, right? So. But, but my interpretation of this is that Jesus doesn't have a tattoo. Uh, but we don't know 100%, but it seems like it would contradict Scripture. So, uh, does that make sense? Um, and uh, so actually one of my daughters has a tattoo on her, on her ankle, very faint. And, uh, and she prayed about it. And yeah. So, um, but that's, yeah, so that's, uh, that's something that, that's a, it's a big decision. Uh, and so when we look at that Jesus as, as being King of Kings and Lords of Lords, you know, what is that? We need to look at that scripture. That phrase um, is used, as I said, 1 Timothy 6.15, twice in Revelation. You've heard both verses, Revelation 17, 14, and uh, 19, 16. And the other passages are in the Old Testament, where it's used, uh, King of Kings. Um, and so, uh, when we look at uh, what this means, um, it's, it's the idea that it is the, the ultimate king, the ultimate lord. And uh, ultimately, when we, when we think about what it means, it means at the end of time, and that's why Revelation is so important, that there will be the reign and rule of God for eternity. And so when we think about scripture, we need to think about uh, not just the present time, but also the future. And that's we, when we think about Christmas, it's the birth of Jesus, but Jesus was born so that he could come back again. And so we, we anticipate the second coming. Um, when we look at uh, the book of Revelation, I remember, I think I've told you that you know, most pastors don't preach about Revelation. It's complicated. And so when, my, when we had a family Bible study a couple of years ago, we took a vote, what, you know, what should we study? And you know what they all voted for? Revelation because it puts me on the spot. Uh, but it's, it's amazing. I mean, in this day and age, we like battles, we like action, and so this, so Revelation is filled with that. And we also take confidence uh, in Revelation. It says, uh, blessed are you who reads these words. It doesn't say blessed are you who understands these words. And so we have to be careful that we, uh, uh, 
many, many people spend a lot of energy trying to understand Revelation and try to interpret it. But the reality is it, it's impossible. Only God knows. And so when we, when, we, when we pull truths out of Revelation, we need to focus on what it means in our lives and how we need to make God Lord of Lords and King of Kings, Lord of our life and King of our life. And so um, when we look at the, this is what John Piper says about Revelation. Uh, in chapter 5 of Revelation, the Lamb, so we, we hear a lot about the Lamb, that's Jesus, the perfect sacrifice for sins, is the only one in all creation found worthy to open the scroll containing the judgments of God. And then we hear in chapter 11, voices in heaven proclaiming that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of Christ. So Revelation is a lot about the kingdom, and he will reign forever and ever. Chapter 12 in Revelation, we read that the authority of Christ is what causes Satan to be thrown down to earth. Because remember, many kings have a powerful army, and God has the most powerful army. So, so Revelation is about the defeat of Satan. Satan is trying to take away that kingdom. Uh, and then Revelation uh, 17, the Lamb conquers all of those arrayed against him. And John stresses that he conquers because he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And finally, in chapter 19, we read of Jesus' triumph coming to strike the nations and tread the winepress of the wrath of God, having the authority to do so because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. So that theme is throughout Revelation. And so the idea of Jesus being King of kings and Lord of lords means there's no higher authority. And, and it's about his reign over all things, which is absolute and permanent. And so God raised him from the dead and placed him over all things. So that's the message of this passage is what it means to have Jesus ruling and reigning over our hearts. And so uh, when we look at, um, at, at what we take away from this, we realize practical aspect of this is what does it mean in my heart for Jesus to be my king and so uh, we talk about citizenship so I make I kind of laugh sometimes because like, when I travel abroad and people say uh, they look at me and they say are you American and they hear my funny California accent and so sometimes I joke with them and I say well, actually, sometimes Americans are viewed as negatively in, in some countries. So sometimes I joke and I say, you know, this, they say, no, I'm, I'm Indian. And they look at me and say, you're not Indian. And then I start to speak the Indian language, right? Gujarati. I say, yeah, so I, I'm Indian. And they say, no, 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 you're not Indian. And I give them some history of India, especially the Gujarati era. So I know a lot about, I know about, and then I tell them what food I like how I eat Indian food. So I'm Indian. Okay, does that mean, I, and then I, I, uh, I uh, you know, so, I'm, so I'm kind of joking with them, but what does it mean to be the citizen, to, you know, to be something? And then, uh, then I talk about, then I show them my, my keychain. And who do I have on my keychain? Mahatma Gandhi. So he's, he's many times seen the spiritual leader of India. And what's on the back? The Indian flag. So does this prove that I'm a citizen? Of, uh, of India. And then I say, well, and then, you know, some people wear a cross around their neck and they say, well, that means I'm a Christian, right? But, but what, what is it about? Uh, and then I say, no, 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 well, I'm half Indian. And I say, they look at me and I say, ah, inside half, right? So I'm not like this. And so it's, so it's complicated. What does it mean? Uh, uh, and then finally, you know, but I'm kidding, obviously, because I'm not, I have a, I have a, American passport. Uh, but other times I say that I have dual citizenship. Okay, because as some of my Japanese friends, uh, they have dual citizenship. Not, not, all, not a lot of countries allow this. Does Indonesia allow that? Dual citizenship? I don't think so. So like when my kids were adopted from China, you know, they came and they had a Chinese passport. And then they became naturalized US citizens and they had to destroy their Chinese passport. They're not so so, in, and when I get, try to get a visa for them, the Chinese consulate, uh, they actually have to show their, their destroyed Chinese passport it has a punch hole in it because they want to make sure you cannot have dual citizenship. Um, but other countries, like J Japan, allows dual citizenship. And so some of my Japanese friends, 
uh, the kids are born in the U.S. and so they use a they get two passports. They get they have a Japanese passport for traveling to Japan because it's easier to enter Japan with a Japanese passport, right? But when they travel back to the U.S., they use their U.S. passport because it's easier to come back to the U.S. with a U.S. passport. So that's dual citizenship. Not all countries allow that. So my dual citizenship, I sometimes say, is I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the United States. Uh -huh. So that's another way to look at it. But the reality is, you know, that's, that's a good way to look at it. And uh, when we make, but it's complicated because when I have a decision to make, um, do I listen to God or President Trump or my, my government? You know, so that's, so that, and that's tricky. Um, and so, we, so I want to listen to God first, but the Bible says we should honor our rulers too. And so, uh, but ultimately, my first priority is as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. So that's, uh, uh, and the way I can tell, just like when I try to convince people that I'm a citizen of India, I don't do that with, don't think I'm crazy, I don't do that with everybody, but, uh, but uh, I convince myself because I know, I, know, um, I know Indian history, I know I eat Indian food, I have Indian symbols, uh, I can speak the Indian language. Well, same thing with the kingdom of God. Right? I spend time, I know the history of the kingdom of God. I know my Bible. Um, my, my, void, my language is, is uh, not the Indian language, or, or, but it's, it's, it's the language of Scripture. So I want to bless people. I want to speak spiritual language. And that's, that's also biblical. And uh, I eat spiritual food. What does that mean? That means I... That's the, the Word of God. That's our spiritual food. So I spend time in God's Word every morning. That's more important than my breakfast, is to spend time in God's Word. And so I, so I, I, and, I and the most important thing in being in the kingdom is to, is to worship the King. And so, so, so Jesus, obviously, is worthy of my worship. So that's something that we realize, that people are, are programmed to worship a King. So that's why... The British royals are a big deal when Prince Harry just got married to Meghan Markle, right? And so that was a big people want people worship uh, them. Uh, and so men, and many many kings throughout history and queens have kind of demanded worship. So the Emperor of China, when people would go and weren't even allowed to look at, it, could speak on the other side of the curtain and then would would bow down, right? And so that this is something that many kings, not so much these days, but a lot of kings. Demand worship, and so our King Jesus, right? We 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 want to worship with a pure heart, and so I think that's what Christmas is about: uh, is recognizing that the King has has come. And we want to worship Him, not ne not necessarily by uh, the way that we wor worship earthly kings, but by worshiping in our heart. And so that's something that we realize as we as we think about Christmas: how important it is uh, to put Jesus on His throne. God on the throne and recognize that we're citizens of the king. And isn't it wonderful? Many kings are corrupt okay, because they get so powerful. Um, India used to be ruled by a bunch of prince, princes because you just you would basically have a small area and you, you get a you get a you get some, some some strong people to be in your army and you say, okay, I'm in charge, and you demand uh, you demand things from your subjects. And that's not a good way because usually the, the prince or the king or the emperor becomes corrupt. Uh, and, and eventually they, that doesn't last, and so they implode. And so the amazing thing about our king is that he is perfect. Not, there's no corruption. And so that's one thing I appreciate is to be able to worship a king, to have a ruler that is perfect. And so that's something that, that we can take comfort in. Uh, and so when we think about... Uh, Last week it was the Prince of Peace. Okay, that's also a royal title. And the King of Kings. Next week we'll talk about the gifts of Christmas, where that comes from. And I will bring some of the first gifts to share uh, with you, because I can buy them at the Chinese uh, herbal medicine shop. So we'll do that next week. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for Jesus. We thank you that the uh, King of Kings and the Lords of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, came to earth, was born as a humble baby. And Father, we just thank you.
that you allow us to be citizens of this kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. And Father, we pray that we'll, we will be aware, especially during this Christmas season, of what it means to worship you as, as our king. Father, we want to put you on the throne. And Father, we just pray you'll give each of us wisdom and discernment to know how to worship you. We pray that our hearts will worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, that we will recognize what it means to be citizens of your kingdom, that we will, that we will feed ourselves with your word, that we will have our hearts dwell on you as our king, uh, that we will speak uh, words of grace and blessing to others uh, because we are part of your kingdom. We pray, Father, that you will uh, draw us to worship during this Christmas season, that we will appreciate and be thankful uh, for the gift of Jesus born on Christmas morning. And we pray, Father, that we will uh, humbly uh, bow down in our